So I fire this T1 ref up and I already have pretty low expectations for the CPU temps here. And you know, sure enough, at stock CPU settings, we're already 95 degrees and we're thermal throttling. But uh, hey, you know what? That works just fine now. Welcome to Machines and More. In the last video, I showed the case assembly and the build steps and having tested it now, let's talk about optimizing the setup and hopefully I can guide you to a general uh, thought process if you're itching to get set up in this particular case or a smaller SFF system like this. So as a quick recap, I did an initial setup with the ID Cooling SE904 XT. It's a small little jewel tower that fits in the case and uh, we also have the Noctua A9 fan in there. It's set up as a rear intake, mainly less to avoid intaking the GPU's exhaust uh, from the partial flow through cooler of the 3060 Ti card. And then we've got a Fantex T30 case fan on the side panel and that's exhausting from the side. So what it's doing is removing some of the heat from the tower cooler and it's removing some of the heat from the GPU. So. I think that's uh, a good airflow setup to start out with, uh, but we'll get to the CPU first uh, because to get something like the 7700X build to work well with that little tower that fits in the case, it's gonna take a little TLC. Particularly, it's not something inherent to small form factor necessarily, but in this build, short of moving to the C14S, which I will do for the review of the case itself, we're height constrained already, and uh, I've already swapped the fan for the Noctua to A9. Yeah, not too much more we can do. Uh, let's take a quick look here, bone stock settings, hitting that thermal throttle 95 degrees right away in this Blender render. Now the, the 7700X at stock settings, it is a power hungry CPU and for the all core process, it peaked early on at around 145 watts of package power and then it tapered off to 127 as the CPU throttled and that's still a lot. And I've already locked the CPU fan speeds to maximum for run to run consistency. So at this point, the optimizations are gonna have to come from the software side. And uh, so for tuning, I use Ryzen Master. Go ahead and get the latest version. The concept of curve optimizer, it's still the same idea as it was in Ryzen 5000. You're still altering the voltage to clock curve and if done correctly, you can get better temperatures and with at least you know similar performance to when the chip is run stock. There's an auto optimization tool. I would start there just to give you an idea of where things stack up. It'll take a little bit of time, so grab a copy, do something else while it runs. It gave me a minus 30 setting for all cores. And in my experience, this tends to be a little bit aggressive. So while it might work fine for some tasks, it, it might crash your system doing something else. So I tend to err on the side of caution with this number. Uh, you typically wanna give it less of a negative offset. Uh, so I went with minus 25. And you can see right away, just using something quick like Cinebench R20 to test, there's a gain uh, right away, but that's not what we want here uh, because you know it's not performance we're after necessarily it's still thermal throttling of course because all we've done at this point is we've told the cpu go ahead and run at higher clocks if you're given the same voltage so you're just seeing an increase from that uh, the package power is nearly identical between the two settings and what i'm after is getting it to hit somewhere lower than 95 degrees so after you've dialed in the offset and by the way you can go ahead and tune it per core if you want if you have more time and you want to you know kind of be super granular about it, you can, but this is good for a quick and dirty setup. We can go over to the PBO setting to limit our package power tracking or PPT. Uh, recall that 127 watt or so figure from earlier. Uh, you wanna go lower than that. In fact, with a curve optimizer setting like I have here of minus 25, you can usually go quite a bit lower than that and still get the same performance. So what you will do is in Ryzen Master, just change that PPT number down slowly while you run your favorite benchmarking utility uh, for a multi-core process like Cinebench R20 like I'm using here, and just observe how the benchmarks and the temperatures change as you dial that down. So at least for this chip, maybe start at 120, go down to 115, 110, 105 watts. And what you'll start noticing is at some point, the chip will stop hitting thermal throttle during your benchmark. And usually a few notches down, you notice that the performance, it'll start dropping below what you got when the chip was bone stock. And for me, this was 105 watts. So what this is telling me is that while I could limit this chip to 105 watts, I'm giving up performance versus our stock settings. So what you want, might wanna do is just leave it at 110 watts. 
And like, it's already giving me much more reasonable temps at 84 degrees for the all core process. And we're actually even getting a slightly better performance than stock. So while AMD says 95 degrees is the norm, I personally like to have a little bit of headroom instead of it throttling on stock. With that done, we do also want to do a sanity check to make sure our gaming performance isn't impacted. So you can run a game that you like to play and see how it is, right? Uh, but I'll just use Far Cry 6, poorly optimized, uh, more CPU dependent, and this can give us an idea of where things stack up. So if you take a look at the benchmark, more or less, it is the same performance but your CPU temps are much lower. And that means we can get away with lower fan speeds. So that's a huge improvement overall from tuning it a little bit. So essentially what we've done is dial in an undervolt without sacrificing our single core boosts, which are important for tasks like gaming. And so once you find a setting that you're happy with, you can go ahead and dial that into your BIOS. So turning our attention to the GPU, I wanted to set it up in the traditional upright position for just because I wanted to see how dismal those GPU temps would be. And yeah, they are pretty bad. Now I did lock the fan speeds here to a lower point at 70% before doing some noise optimization, but it's fine because we're just comparing the two configurations. Uh, you've got a few millimeters of clearance under the case, right? So this two slot card, it basically goes all the way to the floor. So those intake fans at the bottom, they're getting very limited airflow, assuming you're placing it on a solid surface like a desk. It doesn't have to be that way. In fact, it'd be a huge disservice not to place the GPU up at the top. And all you have to do is place the top panel on the GPU side and you just go ahead and flip the case. And it's like an instant difference here. So there's no reason not to do this unless you feel really strongly about having your GPU at the bottom. And in general, I really like the inverted setup when you have a traditional layout because it really favors the GPU without hampering the CPU. And this is particularly important when you don't have case fans servicing the GPU like you might have in an NR200 or NCase M1 type of setup. So with all that done, you can then play around with fan curves. 80% uh, on the CPU cooler fan was a huge reduction in noise without much penalty for the temps. So if I were setting up a fan curve, I'd likely place it, one of those dots at around 80% or so when the CPU hits 60-ish and then on the GPU side, that 80% level was pretty reasonable for 100% load on the GPU. So now we've got a pretty optimized and very workable Ryzen 7700X setup in the sub 10 liter T1 ref. Will it work better on liquid? Yeah, definitely if you overclock it. If anything, it'll be quieter too, and you'll have the benefit of yet another fan with a 240 or 280 rad. Uh, but I think a little elegant setup like this is kind of fun too, and I reckon the time spent tinkering with it is well worth it, no matter what setup you end up going with. So I hope this helps you out if you're optimizing a case like this. So if you enjoyed it, please give a like, subscribe if you haven't already, build links down below, and hey, stay tuned for the full case and the motherboard review as well. So thanks for watching.